Hi folks, thanks for being here with me today. We're going to just briefly go over a final exam review. I've tried to make this as concise and complete as possible so that you'll be able to use this as a resource to study for your midterm. Sorry, your final. I can't believe, seems to me this semester went by fairly quickly, so I'm still thinking in midterm mode. But um, I just wanted to say that I've really enjoyed working with you all. It's really been a shame that we haven't been able to interact in the same way that we had in the past, but I still think that um, you all are an excellent group of students, and I just want to let you know that I've really enjoyed working with you. So let's dive right in. We'll first take a look at our calendar. So um, let's see, it's Monday. So last Friday you had your last reading summary due. And so your final will be the last um, piece of grade that you have for this class. There'll be about 15 questions. It really should not take you long to complete the final. Um, I've given an hour and a half. That's way more time than you should need. If you have um, special accommodations with disability services, we should have that information. You could go ahead and just uh, send an email, a reminder of your special accommodation. Um, but if it worked for you for the midterm, it should work for you now. Those are the same names for people we have um, to get them special accommodations. So our final is going to be on May 6th, that's this Wednesday, and you could take it between 6 a.m. and 11.59 p.m. And as I said, it'll be an hour and a half long. Some questions are worth more than others. So for example, and I'll talk about this when we really get into it, but I focus a little more on logistic regression than on ecosystem modeling, for example. <clears throat> And the last thing I'll mention is that um, if you have any assignments that you didn't do or that are particularly low in grades, I would say below a C, you can get in touch with us. We might be able to accommodate letting you try to make up some of those points. So it's something that we're willing to do. Right now, grades are pretty high in the class. And so, um, yeah, I, I think everybody's in a pretty good standing right now. Okay, so what did we cover in the second half of the semester? Well, we first had Peter Bass go over multiple regression, and then I discussed logistic regression, and I also threw in there the Man whitney u test. Then Gemma covered PCA modeling, and Jocelyn Lovely covered ecosystem modeling. And so these, all of these components are going to be on the final. And I'll just mention that we read papers associated with each of these topics. And I expect that you've read those papers and that if there's um, fairly simple questions regarding those papers that you would be able to answer those accordingly. Okay, so let's get right into it. Um, I'm gonna jump into Man whitney u test first because it's one of the more simplistic tests it sort of makes sense to talk about it first, even though it's out of the order um, of the sequence in which we covered it in the second half of the semester. It's very similar to uh, a student's t-test. And so um, if you remember, that was comparing means. But what do you do when um, your mean and your median don't line up? And so here's an example. You can see on what we're showing here is the depth to groundwater on the x-axis and the frequency or the count on the y-axis. And um, we have this divided out by groups that did experience groundwater contamination and groups that did not experience groundwater contamination. So essentially those are our two um, samples that we're testing, groundwater contamination and no groundwater contamination. And our response variable, um, we, we wanna ask the question, is there a difference in means or medians for groundwater depth between these two scenarios, ones that did experience groundwater contamination and those that didn't. So typically you would use a student's t-test to see if there is a difference in means. 
But when you look at the histogram for this data, you can see that um, there's uneven variance about the mean. So the mean is the little red line, the red dotted line, and the median is the dotted blue line. And you can see those don't add up very well. And because of that, we have not met our assumptions to calculate a student's t-test. And so what do you do instead? What you would do is calculate a Mann-Whitney U-test. This is a non-parametric test. And what that means is the same thing as saying that there's unequal distribution of variance about the mean. That's the same thing as saying a non-parametric test. So a Mann-Whitney U-test compares differences between two independent groups. In this case, I was just discussing their groups that did have groundwater contamination and groups that did not when the dependent variable is ordinal or continuous. So in our last example, we were just discussing the depth to groundwater is our continuous response variable or dependent variable. And it's not normally distributed. It's a non-parametric test. One nice thing about the Mann-Whitney test is it's good for, um, for testing small sample sizes, that wasn't the case in this example, but it is useful for those scenarios. With the Mann-Whitney U-test, you can test the difference in me medians between two samples. And yes, it's used to test for difference in medians. Um, you're testing whether two samples are likely to have derived from the same population. And it's looking at whether the two populations essentially have um, the same shape the same histogram shape. And it's, um, it's created for when your data is skewed and there's unequal variance about the mean, as I mentioned before, that non-parametric test. And it's for when the distribution does not follow typical distributions like the student's um, distribution or the F distribution. And like all tests, all statistical tests, there are assumptions and you'll need to know this for your final. So the assumptions for the Mann-Whitney U test are that the dependent variable should be measured on an ordinal scale or continuous scale. And as I said, for our example, we were testing um, if there was a difference in medians, the median depth to groundwater, if at sites that were contaminated and weren't contaminated. So yes, we meet that assumption. Our dependent variable is continuous. It's depth to groundwater. The, this is really important. The independent variable should be two independent categorical groups. So in this situation, it is um, contaminated groundwater is one group and then not contaminated is another group. The observations should be independent. This is almost always an assumption. There shouldn't be links in your data, for example. In other words, there should be no relationship between the two groups or within groups. And observations are not normally distributed. However, they should follow the same shape. So they um, are both bell-shaped or they're both skewed left. So um, let me just go back here. You can see that these are right-tailed skew, both of them. And so they do meet that assumption. So, okay, seems like we met all of our assumptions. So now let's go through a hand calculation for Mann-Whitney U-test. You will be doing this on your final. So on, you, on your left, you have a graph that shows you the range of groundwater depths at sites that did experience groundwater contamination and sites that did not experience it. So based on these box and whisker plots, it, the median is the dark middle black bar. And so it does seem to visually that there are there's maybe a difference between these two medians, but we need a formal test to be able, able to say that with certainty. Okay, so what would you do in this circumstance? So first, you need to um, you need to group your data by um, your two samples. So that's the not contaminated and the contaminated sites. And so we've, um, on the, in the spreadsheet here on the right-hand side, the very left column where it says contamination. So we've coded 
sites that did have groundwater contamination as number one, and sites that didn't have groundwater contamination as number two. And then we've ordered our data. So if you could look at the next column that says gw.depth.m, that's the depth to groundwater in meters. And what we've done is we've ordered that data from lowest to highest. So um, as just a reminder, this is only a subset of the data. I think we're looking at what do we have here? Nine. It looks like we have 10 data points, but in reality, this example has, you know, hundreds. So, okay, you can see that um, the lowest depth to groundwater uh, was 1.52 meters, and that um, data point had experienced groundwater contamination. And then if we look at the next row, we see that the, the next shallowest depth to groundwater was 1.83 meters. And when there was a, a spill at that site, it did not result in groundwater contamination. So that's why it's coded with number two. And so on and so forth. So we have this ranked from smallest to highest for our response variable. And then our predictor variable is that contamination that's been coded as either number one for contamination or number two for not contamination. So, so this is your raw data that you would get on maybe a final um, problem. Okay, the next thing we need to do is to rank this data. So you're gonna rank it from smallest to largest. And so what I've simply done is we have 10 data points we had ranked our response variable from smallest to highest. And then based on that ranking, we give, um, um, based on that order, we give a ranking of one through 10. So you could see the most shallow depth to groundwater of 1.52 has a ranking of number one. And then the most um, deep depth to groundwater it was 6.10 meters. And that had a ranking of number 10 because that was the um, largest value. Okay, so now what we're looking at is just the rankings for group number one, which experienced groundwater contamination. So you can see those are all of the associated rankings that um, go with sites that had groundwater contamination. But one thing, but this is really important. You're going to need to do this on your final. So notice here that we have ties in our data. So yes, we've ordered from highest to lowest, but a few data points have the same value. So it looks like we had um, observations for 3.05 meters below the ground surface. And in one circumstance, that resulted in groundwater contamination. So you could see number one, the one that's circled. And then in the other circumstance, it did not result in groundwater contamination. But the, the key here is that we have this tie in the data. We have two data points right next to each other, and then there's the same exact value. So what do you do? You need to break the rank. Okay, so let's look at how to do that. So we had originally ranked these number four and five. So simply what you would do is add those two numbers up. So you would say four plus five, that equals nine, and you divide that by the number of data points, which is two. So that would give you the number 4.5, okay? And that would be the resulting um, break, breaking ranks. So you would change those numbers the number four rank would be changed to 4.5, and then the number five ranked would be changed to 4.5. Let's look at another example. So we have another tie in our data. We have, um, you see that we have two values with groundwater depths of 3.66. So similarly, what we're gonna do is that we had given it a ranking of six and then a ranking of seven. So we're gonna add those two values together and divide by the number of data points. So it would be six plus seven divided by two. So that would give you the number 6.5 and that would be the breaking of the ranks. So the number six rank would then be changed to 6.5 and the number seven rank would be changed to 6.5. I just wanna point out, say you had 
four numbers that were tied. Say we had that 3.05 number repeated, repeated four times, let's say for example. So maybe you had originally ranked it four, five, six, and seven. You would add those four ranks together and then divide by four, okay? So it's always based on the, the number of data points that are tied, and that would be the, um, the denominator, the number of data points that you would use to divide by, okay? So what we have here is we have this final ranked, and we break the ties because any of the numbers that were the same, we break broken those ranks. Um, and you could see that on our final right-hand column. So the, that would be this step. So now what we want to do is add up the ranks for group number one, the groups that did experience groundwater contamination, and groups number two, which did not experience groundwater contamination. So what you can see here is I've circled in the right-hand column all of the ranks for group number one. So let's do that calculation. So ranking for group one, you see that's R1 there on the left-hand side below the, below the graph. So we add up all those ranks. So in group one, we have a ranking of number one, a ranking of 4.5, and a ranking of nine. So we add those numbers together, and for group one, we get a final ranking of 14.5. Now let's look at the rankings for number two. So for all of our um, data points that were in group number two, which did not experience groundwater contamination, you're gonna add up all of those final ranks as well. So you could see you would add together number two, three, 4.5, 6.5, 6.5, 8, and 10. And that would give us our final ranking for group number two. And that equals 40.5. You also need to know the number of observations in each group. So in this example, we have three data points for group number one. So N1 equals three. And then we have seven observations for group number two, so N2 equals seven. Okay, so I've just carried the data over here, so you see we have our rankings for each group. Now what you would do is calculate the, the U test statistic, and the way you do that is you use this equation that you see below here for each group. So you would calculate the U um, the U test statistic for group number one, you would calculate a U test statistic for group number two, and whichever of those values would, uh, was smaller, that would be the value that you would use as your overall U test statistic to compare against a U critical value. Okay, so let's make that calculation for group number one. So what we're doing is we're using this equation to calculate the U-test statistic for group number one, which were sites that experienced groundwater contamination. Okay, so what do we have here? We have N1 times N2. So N1 was three and N2 was seven. So we multiply those together and then we add that to N1, which is three, times um, N1, which was three, plus one, and then we would divide that whole thing by two and then subtract R1, okay, the ranking. So um, the ranking that we got for group one was 14.5. So once we find, um, we do the math on this calculation, we get a U test statistic for group number one equal to 12.5. Now let's make that same calculation for the U test statistic for group number two. Okay, so we're still multiplying together the number of observations for group one and group two. So we have th three times seven. Plus, now we have the number of observations in group number two, which was seven times the num number of observations in group number two, seven plus one, we're gonna divide that by two, and then we're gonna subtract the ranking for group number two, which in this circumstance was 
And once you do the math, you get that the U test statistic for group number two that did not experience groundwater contamination to be 8.5. Okay, so what would we pick for the overall test statistic to compare to our U critical volume? I'm gonna give you a second to think about that. Okay, so we would use group two as our official U-test statistic because it's the lower of the values. It's a smaller number than the U-test statistic generated for group number one. <clears throat> okay, now what we need to do is find our U-critical volume. So we know that the number of observations for group one was three and the number of observations for group number two was seven. So we have this table here on the left hand side and what you're going to do is you're going to go across the top row to find your first number of observations for group number one. So we said that was three. So move over um, to the column for number three. And then we have seven observations for group number two. So in the row column on the left hand side, go down to number seven. And where those two numbers meet, three and seven, you see the number one. And that is our U critical value. Okay, so this is something that's a little different than some of the other tests that we've ran before. And it's how you interpret or how you compare your U critical value to your U test statistic. So <clears throat> if, you, if your U test statistic that you picked is larger than your U critical value that you get from the table, you accept the null hypothesis. And if your U test statistic is smaller than your U critical value, then you reject the null hypothesis. And so that's really important. In order to reject the null hypothesis, which would mean that there was a difference in medians between, uh, or a difference in um, the ground, the excuse me, a difference in the median groundwater depth at sites that did have groundwater contamination and sites that didn't have groundwater contamination. If you were saying there was a difference in those two medians, then your U test statistic that you calculated would have to be smaller than your U critical value from this table. So let's see that comparison. So we calculated a U test statistic of 8.5 and our U critical value in this example is one. So I'm gonna give you a minute to think about that. <clears throat> we would, would we accept or reject the null hypothesis? Okay, well 8.5 is greater than one. So in this circumstance, we are accepting the null hypothesis, which means that there's no difference between ranks or medians for the depth to groundwater between these two samples. Okay, so just to summarize what we've done here, we've calculated by hand a Mann-Whitney U-test. And the way that we did that was we made those ranking, we ordered our data, we created rankings, we broke the ties in the ranks, we calculated the ranking value for groups one and two, and then we calculated a U-test statistic for groups one and two. We found the U-critical value on this table, and then we um, compared that to the U-test statistic that was the smaller of the two that you calculated. So you will have to do that entire process for a different example for your final. You'll be having to figure out if you accept or reject the null hypothesis and then what, the, what that means for this data, which is that statement that's um, on the bottom there. Okay, and just to kind of summarize here, what we're looking at is, um, I had mentioned this in, in my lecture, but sometimes the Mann-Whitney U test is re referred to as a Wilcoxon test or a Wilcox test. You don't need to worry about that. But just notice here, um, when you ran that test, this is an R, it gives you a highly significant p-value below that of alpha of 0 0.05. And so what does that mean? Well, let's go back and look. It means that our 
U test statistic was smaller than our U critical value. And so we rejected the null hypothesis and accepted the alternative. So you might need to know that for your final. Okay, and this last second half of the semester, we didn't really, we covered linear regression in the first half of the semester. And then Peter Bass, just to get you oriented with the multiple linear regression, he gave some background on a simple linear regression. So let's just go over that quickly. So linear regression is used to analyze the relationship of two or more continuous variables. Generally, we use regression to look for evidence that changes in one variable, the predictor or independent variable, is related to another variable, the response or the dependent variable, in a sense um, that the two variables are correlated. And the predictor or independent variable is denoted as X, and the response or um, dependent variable is denoted as Y. And a significant relationship between X and Y means that there's a correlation, but doesn't necessarily prove a cause and effect relationship. Okay, what do we happen? What happens when we add more variables to our regression? It turns into a multiple regression. So let's say we have um, we have p independent variables such that we have independent independent variables x1, x2, to xp infinity. Um, and so let's. For example, say that we have three independent variables that we think might explain a, um, a response variable. So how would that model um, look like? So these would be the, this would be the equations for those all of the different types of models you could make based off of those three variables. So you could have simply just one predictor variable to predict your um, response variable. You could see that in the first line for x1. And you could do that for each variable individually. So you can have a model that predicted how x1 affects y, how x2 affects y, and how x3 affects y. But then there's also various combinations of these predictor variables that you could include in the model that might do a better job of explaining the variance in your y variable. So you can see um, when we go down to the fourth line, um, we've included in this model x1 and x2. So what you could see there is, you know, typically you have your b0, that's your intercept, plus your b1, that's your slope of x1, um, and then your value for x, plus b2, which would be your slope for x2, and then your value of x2, plus some amount of error. Okay, so now at this point, it's getting a little more complicated. We already have four models we're testing. Now we can go even further because we only looked at just um, including x1 and x2. Now you can um, say how you include x1 and x3, and then um, you could include x2 and x3. So you can see there's been um, every combination of x1 and x2 when you're including two variables. And then you can have the full model that includes all variables. So in that final line, you see that we have x1, x2, and x3 that are being included in this model. Okay, so that's a lot of models. And how would we know which one is the best model? Which one is predicting the most amount of variance in our y variable? And which one it is um, just overall the best model? So the, you need to use model selection techniques to figure out which final model that you're going to live with that you think best describes your data. So the goal of model selection will be to find the equation with the least number of variables that, so it's essentially, it's the most parsimonious um, model that has the least number of variables that still explains the highest percentage of variation. So it's this balancing game. And you want, um, you want to find 
the very the model that explains the highest percentage of variation and the least num with the least number of variables and it needs to be comparable to the percentage of variation that ex is explained with all of the variables in the equation <clears throat> The best equation should also be simple and interpretable. So it should contain the smallest number of variables. However, simple and reliable can be opposing criteria. So the best equation is kind of a balance between the two. And so in essence, it's a balancing act between um, accurate prediction and bias. If you use too many variables, you um, are inputting bias into your equation. You don't need to really know so much what that means, but you need to know all this criteria for why we use model selection. This will be on your final. Okay, and so um, what I wanna show you here is one type of model selection technique that's it's really wildly popular. Everyone uses it, it's called AIC. You don't need to worry about how it's calculated or anything, but what you really are going to need to know for your final is that you want to choose the model that has the lowest AIC value. And so let's look at this here. Um, it doesn't say what's, what variables have been included in the model, but if you look at the column for K, that means the number of parameters that were included in the model. So you can see that in this example, actually, when there are seven parameters in the model, it gives you the lowest AIC. I don't think that's very typical. Normally, it's kind of like, say you have, you know, between one and 10 parameters that you, or variables that you can include in your model. Usually, it's kind of like the middle place. So maybe it would be five would give you the lowest AIC. Um, but that's not the case in this example. And so, you know, I might show you a spreadsheet like this and say which model, um, according to the AIC method for model selection, should be the best model. And in this case, you would say that it's that top model. It's the, the global LM global underscore APSC. I know I'm not going into detail about what that means, but you just um, need to know that AIC model selection relies on picking the model that has the lowest AIC score. Okay, here's, um, okay. Don't worry about this DAIC. I'm gonna skip over that. <clears throat> okay, so now what we're going to do is move into logistic regression. And when I gave that talk, um, I used the same data to calculate a logistic regression as I did to calculate the Man Whitney U test. And so um, we're going to figure out why, why we can do that. So this is how we originally had the data um, displayed in the left graphic there. You can see we had it divided out by sites that did not experience groundwater contamination and sites that did experience groundwater contamination. And then on the y-axis, we have the depth to groundwater spill sites. That's a continuous variable. But another way to look at this would be to look at the probabilities of groundwater contamination. And you could get a graphic like you see on the right hand side. And so in the end, these are asking two different questions. For the Man Whitney U test, we were asking if there was a difference in the median depth to groundwater at sites that did have contamination and sites that did not have contamination. Now what we're doing is asking a different contamination. We're saying, um, it, can you predict the probability for groundwater contamination based on this continuous variable for depth to groundwater? So you're going to need to know the difference between these two tests, and, and it's what I just said there. Okay, so just like all of our other tests, there are assumptions, so let's go through that. So the logistic regression does not require a linear relationship between the dependent and independent variable. There's some caveats to that, so I'm going to talk about it in a little bit. The error terms do not need to be normally distributed. Um, homoscedasticity, that's the equal variance about the mean, is not required 
and the dependent variable in logistic regression is not measured on an interval or ratio scale. Okay, so those are just kind of saying why, that first one there is saying why it's different from a linear regression. Um, a linear regression has all of those assumptions and logistic regression does not. So let's look at what those assumptions are for a logistic regression. So um, you have to have the appropriate structure to begin with. So um, a binary logistic regression requires that the dependent variable is binary. And, um, and you don't need to worry about that second part about the ordinal. Don't, don't worry about that. Just the first part, the binary logistic regression requires the dependent variable to be binary. So in this, when we're looking at it in this different way, when we're calculating a logistic regression, um, this time we're saying that the depth to groundwater is our X predictor variable and that our Y response variable is the probability for groundwater contamination. And because of that, um, our response variable, what we had was that there was Yes, it was contaminated or no, it was not contaminated. So there's only two, two, um, two states that it could be in. It's contaminated, it's not contaminated. So you can think of that as different, you know, that's different than if you had, for example, a concentration of contamination in the water and that would make it continuous. Um, in this, in the scenario we're giving, it's this binary response variable. So not only is it categorical, yes, it's, um, there are two categories, there's um, contaminated, not contaminated, it's binary. And so binary is this really important criteria that you have to make so that your structure is correct and you could do a logistic regression. Okay, there's an assumption of observation independence. So Logistic regression requires the observations to be independent of each other. In other words, the observations should not come from repeat measures or from matched data. There's the assumption of absence of multicollinearity. So logistic re regression requires there to be no, um, no correlation between each other. This means that the independent variables should not be too highly correlated with each other. So in the example I'm talking about, we only have one predictor variable, but say that you had multiple predictor variables. Um, for logistic regression, your predictor variables can be continuous or discrete. And the only thing that you need to make sure though is that those predictor variables are not correlated with one another. Okay, there's assumption of linearity of independent variables and log odds. So um, logistic regression assumes linearity of independent variables and log odds. What does that mean? Although the analysis does not require the dependent and independent variables to be related linearly, it requires that the independent variables are linearly related to the log odds. Okay, so we're gonna talk about what that means, don't worry. And then there's an assumption of a large sample size. Okay, let's go over a few examples of when you would use a logistic regression and what that criteria is looks like. So let's say you were predicting if an individual is male or female based on plumage length. Perhaps you would, um, perhaps a scientist would um, hypothesize that female or that males have a longer plumage length. And so could that, uh, could you measure that plumage length and then have that accurately predict whether or not that individual is a male or female? You could use a logistic regression to predict if you will or will not make a basket, a basketball through a hoop depending on the distance from the hoop. So again, we're looking at this response variable that's binary. It's categorical and it's binary. And, um, and then the independent variable in this circumstance is continuous. So that's very similar to the example I gave with groundwater contamination.
Okay, another example is that um, you can use logistic regression to predict if a species will or will not go extinct if global temperatures increase by 0.5, 1, 2, or 5 degrees. And so you could see the way this one's set up, um, the, the predictor variable is um, categorical. It's discrete in this circumstance. And our response variable, yet again, it's binary. So that's, you really are gonna need to remember that the response variable in logistic regression is binary. I'm trying to help you out here. Okay, and then the last example is predicting the presence or absence of a species in a plot based on temperature, which would be a continuous variable, the presence of a food source in a plot, so um, maybe that's a discrete variable, and the number of water outlets, maybe that's a discrete variable. So what you can notice in this example is that we have multiple predictor variables. They run the gamut between being continuous and being categorical, but we still have our response variable as binary, presence, absence. Okay, so we've talked about probability. We mentioned log odds and odds. What does that mean and why do we do it? So the probability of an event happening ranges from zero to one. When we say event happening, um, it's pretty much looking at one event happening over another. So in our groundwater example, it's the probability of groundwater being contaminated, okay? You could have also looked at it as the probability of groundwater not being contaminated. And that could be the event you're interested in. So you have to figure out which event you're interested in. And for me, it was the probability that groundwater is contaminated. Okay, but when we have probabilities, those range from zero to one. So if something has a probability of 0 0.5, then there's a 50% chance of it happening. <clears throat> and then the odds, I'm sure you've heard about odds, maybe people talk about it a lot in horse racing and things like that. So the odds of that event happening are the probability of the event happening divided by the probability of the event not happening. Okay, so here's the equation for that, for the odds. So you could see P happening divided by one minus P happening. So let's give this example. So if the probability of an event happening is 0 0.8, remember that's 80% chance of it happening, then the odds of the event happening is 0 0.8 divided by one minus 0 0.8, and that equals four. Okay, and so, yeah, one thing I just wanted to point out here is um, the denominator. This is the probability of an event not happening. So what's on the numerator and what's on the denominator should add up to one. And that's a good way to make sure that your math is coming out correctly. So, for example, in this example, we have 0 0.8 divided by 1 minus 0 0.8. So that ends up being 0 0.8 divided by 0 0.2. And those two things add up together to be one, okay? So that's how you know that you're getting the right value for your odds. So you've calculated the odds. And now what you might notice is that by calculating the odds, it turns your probability ranging between only zero and one to being um, infinite possibilities um, both positive and negative. Okay, and now what happens when you calculate the log odds? What's that? So rather than just calculating the odds, you can calculate the log odds. So it's the same exact thing of calculating the odds, but once you've made that calculation, you take the log of the number. So it would be the log of the probability of an event happening divided by the probability of the event not happening. And so why would you do this? Um, I'm gonna show you that in just a minute. Okay, so what are we doing here? Um, so just to remind you what our research question was, we wanna know if the depth to groundwater, which is a predictor, continuous predictor variable, can significantly predict the probability for groundwater contamination, which is our event, from a surface produced water spill. Okay, so here's our data on the left in the spreadsheet. 
So you can see how our data is um, formatted. We have um, in that very left column, well, hold on, let's start off with the total number of observations. So at a groundwater depth of one, we found four, we had 14 observations. 11 of those um, circumstances did have groundwater contamination and three of those did not have groundwater contamination. Let's look at the same thing for the uh, groundwater depth of two meters below the surface. So at sites that had groundwater two meters below the surface, we had 32 total observations. 29 of those observations did result in groundwater contamination and three of those observations did not result in groundwater contamination. Okay, so just looking at that, we have our yes and no. That's really um, that, binary that binary response variable and it's, it allows us to calculate the probability of the event happening. So as I said, what I'm considering the event to be happening is groundwater contamination. So I calculate the probability by um, taking the um, number of observations that did result in groundwater contamination in that first row, it's 11, and I divide that by our total number of observations. And so you could see at depths of what, when groundwater was one meter below the surface, 70, about 79% of all of those produced water spills resulted in groundwater contamination. Let's look at the next row. So at sites that had ground, uh, the depth to groundwater at two meters below the surface, about 90% of all of those observations resulted in groundwater contamination. So in this last column, what we've done is we've calculated the probability of, a, of an event happening. And then when you graph that, as you can see on the right, you can start to notice there does seem to be a strong trend in the data. So what we would like to do is to create an equation that would allow us to ac accurately predict the probability for groundwater contamination. Okay, so now we're going to talk about why we calculate, why we start off with probability, then we calculate the odds and then the log odds. Okay, so the reason is because that Regressions are easier to model when they're linear and when the response value can have infinite positive and negative values. So as I mentioned before, when you have probability, you have a finite number of values that you can get for your response value. It would be between zero and one. But when you take the odds, what you've done is you're changing that data so there's infinite possibilities of in your response variable, both positive and negative. And then, but when you do that, you still have this sort of curve in your data. Hold on, let's go back. So we're looking at the graph on the right. You can see the probabilities on the y-axis and we have this curve to, a data, or to our data and we want it to be linear. So we calculated the odds that gave us the infinite values and both positive and negative. But when you take the log, you're transforming your data and it'll transform it to be linear. So that's the important thing that you need to take home from this slide is that, you know, your probabilities are finite from zero to one. You want infinite values for your response variable. So then you calculate the odds but you still have that curve to your data. So then you transform it by taking the log and then that turns your data to be linear. So all those, those two things, well, you have to calculate your probability, your odds, and then your log odds. Those three things have to be done in order to calculate your logistic regression. Okay, so let's look at our um, results here. This is results from R and what, these are giving you are the parameter estimates for your logistic regression equation. And we can pull those out to write the, mo the model equation. So we say that the log odds for our response variable y 
equals the intercept that was calculated, which was negative 3.476 plus a slope times our x value. And the slope that we got from our, our calculation is 1.825. So these are the log odd coefficients that, um, to, yeah, these are the coefficients that would give you the log odds, but they don't really make sense um, to just think about them in your brain. And because of that, you would need to back transform to get your probabilities because that's something we can actually understand. Um, oh. I meant to show this earlier, I'm sorry. Okay, so this is just a demonstration one more time of why we would be um, calculating the probability, then the odds and the log odds. Okay, so we have this probability that we've calculated um, to the right of the spreadsheet. And then we just wrapped that. So on the x-axis, we have depth to groundwater. And on the y-axis, we have the probability of the event happening, the probability of groundwater contamination. We have a curve in the data, and our numbers are finite. They span between 0 and 1. So let's make our odds calculation. So our odds would be the probability of the event happening over the probability of the event not happening. And so now what you can see is you have um, this, your Y response variable is infinite, the odds, whereas before it was limited to zero and one, but it still had that curve in the data. So then if you take the log of the odds, what you could see is it's linearized our data and we're able to add a linear regression line to that. Um, and you could back transform that in order to get your probabilities yet again. Okay, so let's uh, look at our results. So, um, uh, I'm sorry, hold on a second. Okay, when we go back here, this was just an example um, of the results. I don't think that was actually for my logistic regression example. It's just um, how you would turn those parameters into your equation. So let's look at the real results from, from my research question. Okay, so here's what we got. We can see we have, um, first off, our log odds per parameters. So what this is saying is when the depth of groundwater is zero, the log of the odds for groundwater contamination is 2.2550. So, you know, the log of the odds is something that's not, doesn't really make sense. Um, probabilities make more sense. But what this also means is that for every one unit increase in X, so in our example, it's every one meter, meter increase in depth, the log of the odds change by the estimate. So it decreases by 0 0.5451. And if we turned that into our equation, what it would be is the log odds for groundwater contamination equals our intercept 2.2550 plus our parameter slope estimate for our X predictor value, which was negative 0 0.5451, and we would multiply that by our depth to groundwater. Okay, this other value that I want you to know about is our Z value. It's the number of standard deviations away from zero on the normal curve. And it's um, the estimate, if the estimate is um, less than or more than two, oh, I'm sorry, I'm asking you this question. Is the estimate less than or more than two standard deviations away from zero? So you can see for the intercept, it's higher, um, larger than two. And for the, uh, the predictor variable, it's far below two, okay? So what that means is that it doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. If the value is larger than two on one side, or if it's below two on the negative side, then you reject your null hypothesis, accept the alternative, and you would have a significant p-value. And so that's what you see there. And so another way to think of that z-value is that 
when you're looking at that normal curve on the right, those tail regions, um, that means that your, um, your value is winding up in those tail regions. And you know that when that happens, you um, reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis. Okay, so this is going to be very important for your final. We're going to go through kind of this back calculation from our log odd parameter estimates to get our probabilities. And so the reason we could do this, um, we know that our log odds of our y um, dependent variable equals our intercept plus our slope times x. We also know that log odds equals the log of the probability of an event happening over the probability of an event not happening. So these two equations are equivalent. So if you make them equal to each other and solve for P, this is the resulting equation that you would need. Make sure you have this equation written down for your final. I will not be giving you this equation. You will just need to know it, um, that you need to use it and how you need to use it. Okay, so let's just take a look. Recall, these are our parameter estimates that we got from our logistic regression. So we know that the intercept, we have the intercept and we have um, our depth, our, um, our predictor variable parameter estimate. So now all we have to do is just plug in that information. So we're saying the probability of y equals the e, or it equals e to the intercept plus the slope times x divided by one plus e to the intercept plus the slope times x. So let's do an example. Okay. So I'm saying calculate the probability of groundwater contamination when the depth to groundwater is three meters below the surface. So we have our equation. Um, you have your equation, you plugged in your parameter estimates, as you can see here, and now all you need to do is plug in your X values, which is three meters, and solve for P. So we're adding three in there. We reduce down our equation a little further here. <clears throat> um, so now we have e to the 0 0.6197 divided by 1 plus e to the 0 0.6197. And here is the resulting value that you get. So when the depth to groundwater is 3 meters below the surface, if there's a produced water spill there, the probability of groundwater contamination is 0 0.65, or there's a 65% chance of groundwater contamination if there's a produced water spill and the depth to groundwater at that location is three meters below the surface. Okay, so let's look at that interpretation. I maybe said it a little differently, so let's go through that. When the depth of groundwater is three meters below the surface, the probability of groundwater contamination at that site is 0.65 or 65% if that site experiences a produced water spill. So on your final, I could give you any value for X, and I would expect you to be able to go through this process to back calculate the probabilities from your log odd parameter estimates, okay? So you're going to need to know, I'm going to give you the parameter estimates like you see on the left kind of middle side. You would need to know how to input, input that into the equation that I have highlighted with a box, and then input your X value and calculate a resulting probability. That will definitely be on your final. Okay, and so once you do that for every value or every depth to groundwater contamination, so let's say I use that equation, I plugged in um, a groundwater depth of one, and then a groundwater depth of two, and then three. 
So that would be back calculating your regression line. And so you can see that's what I've done here. And um, we have a statistically significant correlation between the depth to groundwater and the probability of groundwater contamination in the event of a produced water spill. And this won't be on your final, but unlike linear regression, we don't use R squared. We use this maximum likelihood test um, called the McFadden pseudo R squared. You don't need to worry about that. Okay, so now we're going to go on to talk about um, PCA, principal component analysis, and this was covered by your wonderful TA, Gemma. And um, the point of calculating a PCA is really to um, reduce the number of dimensions in really large data sets. So that it can make sense to us, you know, in our own brain. And so the example that Gemma had gone through was looking at a variety of samples. Um, I, I can't remember if she was looking at particular individuals. Let's just say she was talking about individuals and then measured the number of genes that were expressed in each individual. So for example, her example here, she has genes A through F, and then she has samples one through seven. So you can think of, of samples as like an individual. Say, you know, I was sample number one, and I was tested for all of those different genes. So one thing to notice here is that the these numbers, these are all, um, this is count data. So if I'm sample number one, I had five counts of GA or of gene A, and I had four counts of gene B and six counts of gene C. Okay, and so um, you might be able to tell that this can get fairly complicated. If you want to see, you want to see um, two things from a principal component analysis. You want to see how. Um, how each of these samples group together in such that who is most related to the other. That's one thing you want to find out. And then the other thing you want to find out is how correlated are these different genes. So those are the two um, takeaways that you can get from a principal component analysis. And one way you can think of it is by um, looking at how each gene correlates with another gene. And you, to do that, you would um, create a covariance matrix and you would calculate correlation coefficients. This is nothing that you're going to need to know specifically for your final, it's just um, visual to demonstrate. And so, um, you know, you can see that there's a, a linear positive relationship between gene A and gene B. But if you look at gene A compared to gene F, which is the the box that's on the right upper side, um, you could see that there's a negative correlation between those genes. And one thing you might notice here is when we make this covariance matrix, you're not seeing these different samples, sample one, two, and three. That's because we've ordered the data. So let's just take a look at gene A compared to gene B. So what, would you, what you would do is that on the x-axis, would perhaps be gene A, and then on the y-axis would be gene B. So let's look for sample number one. So sample number one had five of gene A and four of gene B. So you would go over on your x-axis to five, and then you would go up your y-axis to four. And so sample one would be represented by that point. You would all um, order all of your samples like that and see what resulting line you get. Okay, so how do we interpret the covariance matrix? You will need to know this, your final. So the sample covariance is a measure of the association between a pair of variables. In the example we're looking at, these variables are genes. So the covariance of zero implies that two genes or variables are uncorrelated. They do not correlate with one another. A covariance of more than zero implies that two genes or your variables are positively correlated. And similarly, a covariance of less than zero implies that two genes or variables are negatively correlated. 
And you can sort of think of this as a slope. But there is a major difference between variance and covariance. And this is going to be on your final, so make sure that you have this one figured out. So variance and covariance are two different statistical ideas. Variance is measured, uh, is a measure of how, of the spread in the data set. And we've talked about this quite a lot. So when you look at the upper left graphic, um, you can see that there's very little spread across the data set. It's very, it's tightly hugging the regression line. Whereas the, the graph on the upper right hand side, there's quite a lot of spread of the data. So, so the variance for the graphic on the right would be much larger than the variance for the graphic on the left. And you would use that for a linear regression, multiple, multiple linear regression. Covariance is different, you use that with PCA, and the covariance is the extent to which corresponding elements from two sets of ordered data move in the same direction. So let's kind of break down what that means. Um, two sets, so that's comparing, as I mentioned, perhaps gene A on the x-axis, gene B on the y-axis, so that's our two sets of data. It's been ordered because um, we've taken each one of our samples, say you remember I was saying I'm sample one, I had five counts of gene A and four counts of gene B, and then maybe you had you know, six counts of gene A and four counts of gene B, and you would order those and put those on your graph. That's why they're saying it's ordered data. And we're looking to see whether they move in the same direction. Okay, let's look at that a little more. So <clears throat> um, in the correlation coefficients, the population correlation is defined to be equal to the covariance between two variables. So that's um, that what we were saying is kind of, you can think of it as a slope. So that covariance between two variables divided by the product of the standard deviation of each variable taken separately. You won't need to make this calculation, don't worry. And so um, this is giving you an R value. R is the correlation coefficient. And I want to make a distinction between um, R squared, which is the coefficient of determination. You use the R squared in a regression, and it's the proportion of the variance in the dependent variable that is predictable from the independent variable. So, um, you know, that's the goodness of fit. That's looking to see how well your regression line fits your data. So, um, R, the correlation coefficient, is doing something different for you. And so um, you're going to need to, you're going to need to know why um, these two things are different and which scenario you would use them for. So you would use the R squared for your linear and multiple regressions. And then you would use this R correlation coefficient for um, co of, for calculating a PCA. Okay, so let's look at some results. So this is our input data that we had, and here's what's called the principal components. This is the main output that you would get from a PCA. And so when you have clusters, what you've done is you've taken this many large dimensional data and you've reduced it down to two dimensions mainly principal component one and principal component two. So clustering means that samples are similar. So what you can see is that samples one, four, six, and two are similar, and that sample seven and two are distinctly similar, but they're different from that other group. And then um, sample number five isn't grouping with any of these other samples. And the principal components are linearly uncorrelated variables. So it's dividing out the data to show where there's differences in groups. The first principal component or factor one explains most of the variance in the data. And then the second principal component, which is on the y-axis, um, explains the second most variance in the data.
The PCA also gives you a biplot um, and it gives you the loading for each variable. This is sort of what I find to be the most uh, um, important here. Okay, so let's look at why. And so um, if you have a 90 degree angle between our genes, um, that means that they are not correlated. So for example, here D and C, it looks like D and C have a right angle and so they are not correlated with one another. If you have an acute angle or a smaller angle less than 90 degrees, that means you have positively correlated genes. So for example, genes A and C are positively correlated, genes C and F are positively correlated, it even looks like A and B are slightly positively correlated because they're not quite at 90 degrees. And then an obtuse angle means that your genes or your variables, your predictor variables are um, negatively correlated. So for example, um, D and E have this obtuse angle, so they're negatively correlated. A and E are negatively correlated. So I would expect you to be able to look at a graphic like this to say which samples are grouped together. So you would, you would be able to say there's three distinct groups. The first group has one, four, two, and six samples. Um, the second group is two and seven. And then the third group is just five. And then you would also need to look at these, um, the biplot, um, to see the, um, how each variable is correlated or uncorrelated or not correlated at all with one another. Okay, we'll move on to this last topic, which was um, ecosystem modeling. I hope you liked Jocelyn's um, <laughs> lecture. I thought it was pretty hilarious. She's a funny person. So if you ever get a chance to talk to her, I highly recommend it. She'll be at CSU for at least a little while more. Um, and so she talked about ecosystem modeling. You know, when we talk about modeling, um, you know, we use the, we kind of throw the term around pretty frequently. Um, and it can mean kind of different things to different people. But in the most simple of terms, a model is just a simplified representation of reality. And Jocelyn kept pointing us back to um, that map and how they took some remote sensing images, they pulled out an abstract representation of some key features like the roads and maybe the parks and a few stores. And so she had mentioned to us that depending on your purpose, so for a map it may be to find driving directions. So you would have to think about what are the most important pieces to include in your model that would be able to most accurately um, use the map so that you can get where you need to go. In ecosystem modeling, we're looking more at um, like the mass of one population versus the mass of another and how these things fluctuate and affect one another as well as other um, abiotic influences as well. So if models are abstractions, then, we use, um, then what we use to represent reality becomes a key question. And so that's when I was discussing, you know, what we include in our model is really important. Um, so let's go into that a little more. So really all I want you to know for the final are these different types of models. So there are really, I mean, there are six different types of models. Sometimes there's not a clear boundary between these. Between these. So there's statistical versus process-based, there's deterministic versus stochastic, and then there's um, phenomenological versus process-based. And so um, we're gonna go through, I want you to know the difference between all of these. And um, I would maybe be able to give you some examples and you would have to say, oh, you know, that's the stochastic, that's deterministic. Okay, so let's look at this first one. Statistical versus theoretical. So um, a statistical model would be 
like something that we've done in this class already. We want to see if predicted values depend on some observed values or some constants. So it's usually not the kind of model we're interested in, in when we're looking at systems modeling. This is more of a simplistic model. However, system and si simulation models may include statistical models as components, but usually ecosystem models are kind of more broad, taking in you know, multiple um, influencing variables. Um, just a note, this is what I've told you this before, but you don't really want to extrapolate beyond the range of measured values. Um, so for example, in this here, um, you could see we have on our X axis, we have fish length. This is um, what we've taken from our homeworks. So it looks like, you know, maybe the maximum fish length was something like 33 centimeters. So I wouldn't really want to extrapolate beyond that. Even though we have a regression line that would be able to give you a value. Say if I gave an input value for X of 100, we don't really know if the shape of this line changes when you get that far out. So it's, it's not advisable. But yeah, anyway, so this is a statistical model and this is the type of thing that we've historically done in this class. Okay, now let's look at a theoretical model. So a theoretic, theoretical model is based on laws and nature, and it usually has terms with biological significance, at least in the ecosystem modeling arena. So this is an example for um, making photosynthesis calculations. And so this is a theoretical model. It's based on our understanding of nature and how these variables interact with one another. Okay, now we're going to look at deterministic versus stochastic models. So a deterministic model does not attempt to include the effects of random variability in forcings, um, functions, or parameters. The inputs are values. So for whatever input you give, you would always get the same output. That's not necessarily well, it doesn't represent reality because we know um, that we have variability in data. And if you remember in R, when we used that P norm function, you know, we had said, give us a random variable from this data distribution. And every time we did that, we got a different value because there is variance. So sometimes deterministic models, they're, they're definitely helpful, but um, they kind of can be losing some of the um, fine detail that would give you a more accurate number. Okay, now let's look at stochastic. A stochastic model attempts to include the effects of random variability in forcing functions and parameters. The inputs or parameters are determined from a probability distribution, which you all are very familiar with. So, um, um, and it would be looking at, um, one example here is random events. So like, weather, hail, early frost, lightning strikes, that would all affect um, your output variable that you would get. And your output variable would change every time you ran a model because there is that variability that's taken into account. Okay, the last type of model that you probably should look at for, um, for your final is uh, Oh my God, don't make me say this out loud. Y'all know I can't do it under pressure. <laughs> um, but the phenomenon type of model versus a process-based model. Okay, so the example that Jocelyn gave here was when you're, if you wanted to model when aspens turn gold in the mountain. So we know that the process um, that goes into um, making leaves turn gold involves a variety of things. It's not just one variable. So for example, air temperature, soil moisture, aspect, day length, there's all these variables that would um, be inputs to accurately predict when aspens were going to turn gold. However, you might not need to measure all of those different variables in order to get an accurate estimation of when aspens are gonna turn gold. Because some 
because first off, probably a lot of these variables are correlated, okay? So you would maybe only need to measure one or two so that you can get a good understanding and an accurate representation of when aspens are gonna turn gold. And so in this example, um, the phenomenon that we measure is elevation and day of year, and that would be enough to accurately predict when aspens are gonna turn gold, even though it doesn't include all of the different process-based parameters, it can still be very accurate. And, and a lot of times um, it comes down to the type of question you're asking. Are you really interested in the process or are you really interested in just finding out your, um, your response variable, essentially? In this case, you know, maybe you only cared about just, you know, all you want to know is when aspens are going to turn gold. You don't really care what process drives it. You're just interested in that. Okay, so that's all I have for you today. Let's just go over the things that are going to be important for you to know for the final. So you're going to need to be able, and this is in no particular order, you're going to need to calculate the probabilities from a logistic regression parameters. You're going to need to hand calculate a Man Whitney U test from beginning to end. You need to know what the difference is between R and R squared for PCA. You're going to need to know um, those uh, six types of models that I just described. You'll definitely need to know the assumptions for logistic regression and Man Whitney U test. Uh, you won't need it for PCA. And then you're going to need to know a little bit about ACI or AIC model selection and why you would choose one model, not why you would choose one model over another, but um, what value of AIC um, that you get that would help you pick your um, final model. And God, let's see, there's one other thing about AIC I wanted to tell you. Um, Geez, what was that? Um, oh yeah, and just understanding um, uh, those that description of model selection that you want to balance um, predictability and bias. Okay, and so I thought I would just finish up this semester here talking a little bit about careers and where you're going to go from here. Because I know many of you are graduating this semester, and it's a pretty weird time to be graduating. Um, you know, I, I'm gathering that many of you will be looking for jobs, and you sort of don't know what the future will bring. And that's okay, because we never do. <laughs> and so I just wanted to remind, yourself, remind all of us that um, things are going to work out. Everything is going to be okay. You all will be able to find good, meaningful jobs for your career and for your self-development. And so I want to just encourage you to keep your head up during these bizarro times. Um, another thing I wanted to do is sort of talk about some of the pitfalls I've fallen into um, along my career. So Let's see, I'm uh, 30, I think I'm 35 now, okay? So I'm not that much older than you. And I have been, um, have quite a circuitous career path myself, but I'm at this really amazing place where my career is starting to kick off. And I'm so thankful for that because for a really long time, I didn't think it was going to happen. And so, so that's what I wanna tell you right now is that, your path could be um, different. You can, you could experience challenges. You can even screw up and it's not the end of the world. Um, so I'll just kind of tell you about what I consider to be my screw up. So when I was leaving undergraduate, I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but I had been sort of pressured to getting a PhD. I was in a program that was like, getting a PhD is the bee's knees, you should do it. And, but I had no idea what I wanted to study really or what I was going to do. But I, did, I got into graduate school at, at UNC Chapel Hill. And so I went there and I started a PhD. I really did not like the wet lab work. Um, I liked studying it, but I didn't like the actual work. 
And that's something I want to mention is that a lot of times a job can seem great, but what is that day-to-day -day work looking like? Because that's what you're going to spend the most time doing. So um, I think it's really great for you to try out all kinds of different things because you're never going to know if you like something or you don't until you try it. So I was there and I hated the work and I was not doing well. Um, and I sort of just thought, okay, I'm going to graduate with a master's and I'm going to try to figure something else out for myself. And when I did that, I felt like a huge failure. You know, I, I set out to get this PhD. I couldn't do it. I hated it. I really was questioning myself at that time. Am I smart enough? You know, do people believe in me? I've screwed up. Does, is this going to influence the rest of my life? And I just want to tell you right now, no, you can make screw ups in your life and it's okay. People understand that you take a circuitous path in life. And the, the important part is to try it all and figure out what really works for you. Because I ended up deciding, hey, I'm really interested in ecology and I want to go back to school for that. And so I did it. And, um, and it turned out to be really great for me. So just, I, I wanted to share that story with you to know that when you graduate college, it's a really, um, it's an interesting time. It's a time where you can be questioning yourself. It's a time, maybe you're flourishing, you know, maybe you have that internship set up and, or maybe you have that job set up. So it could look really different for everyone. And just don't lose confidence in yourself. Remember that you can do it. I've met you all, and I know that you're highly capable people. I've been really impressed with all of my interactions with you. So, you know, if you're experiencing hardships or you don't quite know what direction you want to go, it's okay. And so I, I kind of put out this list here of just a few things that I thought really helped me um, on my career path. So the first is to surround yourself with smart and dedicated people. And I found that this is pretty pivotal for me. I come from a background, um, my parents are both drug addicts. I don't have relationships with them or really any of my family. So I didn't have that sort of strong network. And what I did to keep myself afloat was I just made excellent friends, really smart, lovely people who believed in me. And they were always, not only were they pushing me to do better, but they knew I could do better. They believed in me. And having that sort of support is just, I would say it's the most important thing to have in your life. Um, do not feel bad to let go of toxic people who don't, their primary goal is not, is not to see you succeed. Um, just don't keep those kind of people in your life. And when you graduate, it's a really good time to consider those things. You know, who, who's in my life that's, you know, really valuable for me and who is kind of dragging me down. And, and I think that's an important thing to think about. Also pursuing meaningful and interesting opportunities. Now, the reason I say this is because not only because of that example of, you know, not liking the wet lab and, and dropping out of that PhD, it's also because you can come across things that you had no idea that you were interested in. And so I just want to mention, you know, I think I had told you all that I'm the chair of the Fort Collins Energy Board. And when I tried out for that board, I wasn't accepted the first time, first off. But I just thought, God, how cool would this be? And I'm interested in, you know, kind of getting into local politics. And so, you know, I did it and it really kind of transformed the way I think about my science, first of all, but also my direction and my trajectory in life. And um, so I just actually, I just received an amazing fellowship. It's called the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship. And I will be working for one or two years in Washington, D.C., either with NSF or USAID. Um, I'll find out on Wednesday. And I'm really excited about that. And the thing that I just found amazing was that when, um, when the people who were interviewing me were looking at my resume or my CV, it wasn't my research that they really cared about. It wasn't like my main job that they cared about. They cared about all these smaller little things that I had done, like my work with the energy board, um, my work 
volunteering for my ballet company. And it was all these sorts of things that I think maybe set me apart from other people. And the, um, so I just want to encourage you, you will not know if you like something or not until you try it out. Trying something in college or like in the lab in college is different than doing it in the real world. So I want to encourage you to try those different things and keep adding little pieces to your resume because eventually those things really build up and make you a really strong candidate. Um, okay, I'll mention this. I know a lot of us have mental health problems or it's not even problems. It's just a, a product of being a human. But I want to remind you to be mentally nice to yourself. And what I mean by that is we can have narratives going on in the background of our head saying, I'm a loser, I'm not smart enough, I cannot do this, you know, what am I doing here with these people? And it's easy to fall down that trap. And I think probably everyone has those feelings. And so it takes really some mental discipline to tell yourself, hey, I'm smart, I belong here, people like me. You know, I, I think um, we're really harsh on ourselves mentally, and we need to be strong in the sense that we need to tell ourselves that we're doing, doing good, and we need to be proud of ourselves. So practice every day telling yourself that you are doing great and that you are trying, you know, and then if you screw up, give yourself mental grace. Tell yourself, hey, that doesn't define who I am, and I'm just going to do better next time. And no one's judging me off of this. I'm judging myself more harshly than anyone else is. So I think that's a key component to being successful in your career search, too, is to, you know, mentally bolster yourself. Tell yourself that you're doing great and you will be. Um, and then the last thing I want to mention is about reimagining yourself. I think we sort of get stuck in thinking about how, who we are as a person, you know, I'm a dancer and I'm a scientist and I sort of hate having those um, titles, you know, because they're really not helpful to me. Um, and then what happens if in the, you know, I'm getting older and so I won't be able to do ballet forever. If my whole self-worth is tied to me being a ballet dancer, then I might not be feeling very good about myself when it ends. And so I think you need to reimagine in yourself, think about all of the different things that you can do. You're definitely more than just your career. You're more than your hobbies. You're, you can really do anything. And, and so that's sort of what I've learned through this process is that if you believe in yourself, that's the number one thing that's going to help you be successful in your career and get you to where you want to be in your life. Well, anyways, I hope that wasn't too philosophical for you, <laughs> but I just thought I would end on that note because, um, you know, since I'm getting that new position, I've been really thinking a lot about what got me here. And so if you want to have a discussion like this further, um, if you need any pointers for where to go, if you're looking for internships, anything like that, I would be happy to help. I'm around still. And, um, Oh, gosh, last thing I just, this is actually related to class. Last thing that I'll mention is that please, please figure, fill out your student evaluation survey. You will get a point on your final if you do. I'll check, okay? So um, only do it for the lecture portion. You don't need to do it for the lab unless you want to, but definitely do it for the lecture. And with that, I will give you a send off. And it's been so wonderful working with you. I um, hope nothing but the best for you. Think of me as a resource and let's stay in touch. Thanks, bye everyone.